thank the fire department and all the members. There's a lot of members here tonight. And this is a perfect opportunity for any one of us and all of us to just say thank you. These are people who dedicate hundreds of hours of their time to specialized training, give up a lot of family time and things that they could probably be otherwise doing. So I want to thank everyone here from the fire department. We have representatives from the Smithtown Department of Public Safety. And we have presenters tonight from the American Red Cross, New York State Office of Emergency Management, Suffolk County Office of, I want to, Emergency Management as well. I always want to get the titles right. And we have representatives from LIPA National Grid and all our power companies who are going to enlighten you far more than I will. And in terms of what our program is, we've been doing this about four or five years. And I say this every time we do it. Some people say, you know, why are you doing this? You really should be focusing on other things. And I understand that to a degree, but frankly, I don't agree. And given the facts and circumstances that we find ourselves in the last couple of days and over the last week, this is good timing, and it's a good uh, opportunity for people to get educated. So you're going to hear from people who are the pros, some who are pros in a volunteer capacity, some who are pros in a paid capacity. And I look at my obligation as part of my responsibility to help impart information to the public. You want to hear general things from people like Mir. You want to hear specific things from all these folks here, and equally as important from these folks over here, because this is what they do every day. So we have an obligation, and I think a responsibility, to give you good, detailed information, allow you the opportunity to ask questions, and you will find out that, you know, I hope and I believe that you'll learn a lot of good things and that you will share it with people that you know. Because now, you know, people are paying a heck of a lot more attention than they were even 24 hours ago, and something tells me tomorrow more people are going to say, this is the type of stuff that we should be talking about. I mentioned this yesterday, and I'm using it as an example. It's human nature. Even when you think you know certain things, we had that little earthquake yesterday, and everybody felt it up here. Well, when we came, I came back to my office right as this was unfolding, and I see a lot of people outside the building. And these gentlemen will tell you, one of the things that you shouldn't do is leave a building. You get in a safe place. It's a simple fact, but that is an isolated example of what happens. You know, you act instinctively, and your inclination is, I got to get out of the building. So the information that you'll get tonight will hopefully be very useful in terms of how you plan and how you respond. And I'll close on this in this context. When I think about these things, I'm no different than anybody else. Whether you're younger, older, whether you have a family or not, people have the same basic concerns. How do I protect the people I love? Where am I going to go in case of an emergency? What am I going to do with my kids? What am I going to do with my parents? What am I going to do with my neighbor who may be living alone next door? What am I going to do with my pets? Where am I going to take them? And God forbid I really need to leave where I am, what am I going to bring with me? So um, again, we all think about the same things. And I will focus on this. And I was just, uh, News 12 asked me this question. I'm going to repeat it. What do you think is the single most important thing that people can do? I think the single most important thing that people can do is listen, because they have great information. And I know it sounds trite and it sounds corny in a way, but people are instinctive to act. And if you soak in all the information, the ability and the willingness to listen makes all the difference in the world. My name is David Zatlin, and I'm the regional director of New York State OEM. Our mission is to coordinate and deliver comprehensive emergency management services so the, what do you think we mean by comprehensive emergency management? Comprehensive, big word, right? All right. But more important, we're here to protect lives and property. That's just some bureaucratic stuff we don't have to know. That's not important. This is the map of New York, OK? Our office is, is broken up into five districts, OK? Five regions. Look at the size of those regions up there, huh? Those are, those are very important regions, as you can tell, right? Unfortunately for me, I got the short end of the stick. They only give me this little region over here to worry about. You know, I mean, right? What is it? Nassau, Suffolk, the five boroughs of New York, who cares, right? Nothing. All right. These guys really have to work hard up in these big regions. So comprehensive emergency management. Right now, we're thinking about what? Hurricanes, right? What did we think about yesterday? Earthquakes, OK? But comprehensive emergency management is what we do all the time. All resources, all levels, and all hazards. A lot of different hazards to worry about, you know? Different times of the year, we worry about different ones. So what kind of emergency will New York State face? Let's see. Floods. 
Hurricane. Ice storms. We get ice storms? Absolutely. Blizzards. Tornadoes? Yeah. Fires. For we got forest fires here? You know where that picture was taken? Yeah, it was taken in 1995 in the Pine Barrens. You know, so oftentimes we think that disasters and natural disasters especially, they happen somewhere else. They happen out west, you know, in Smokey the Bear country. Or they happen down south, down in Florida. But we got our, we got our fair share of disasters right here in New York State. How about this? This can happen anywhere. We get them. Yeah, we had two. In about the last 20 years, we had two very serious air disasters, one in Nassau and one in Suffolk. Hazardous material spills? Yeah, they can happen anywhere. Catastrophic structure failure. That can happen anywhere. Doesn't matter. At any time, any time of year. And goes without saying, we got a 10th anniversary coming in a couple of weeks. Terrorism. All right, so what do, what do the people want? What do folks want from us? And what do you, the citizenry, want from us? Well, you want it to be alerted in advance. I think we're doing that. I think the media is doing a pretty good job of that right now, right? After it comes, you want to, you want to be the magnitude assessed quickly. You want to know what happened, how bad was it, what do I have to do, where can I go? You want to be kept informed. And that's one of the reasons we're here tonight, to keep you informed, right? You want the dangerous areas to be closed off and evacuated. You want to be relocated to a safe place. My colleague from Suffolk County is going to be talking about, uh, and Red Cross, going to be talking about that a little later. And you want the recovery assistance provided. That's very, very important. Recovery. This is just some things that we do. It's really not important. Gover governor's role. What's the governor do? He provides leadership during the crisis. He directs the state's resources. He informs the publics of state actions. But most importantly, we go back to that word recovery, all right? He requests federal resources and assistance, all right? We're going to go into that a little bit. All emergencies begin and end locally. What do we do? We co what does New York State OEM do? We coordinate state response with local governments. We advise the governor. We prepare information for public release. We got a lot of stuff back there. And we coordinate with the federal response. All right. All right, recovery. We want to get back to normal as quickly as possible. And that's what we call recovery. And you know, when you, wa you watch the news, and I'm sure all, you're all folks who watch the news and read the newspapers, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here tonight. You always hear about a federal disaster declaration. The president has declared a disaster. Does anybody know how that works or what that really means when the president declares a disaster? I mean, anybody can say, hey, you're a disaster. I just declared you, right? But what does it really mean? Okay, What it really means is that the president of the United States decides that we're going to give money to you for recovery to help you get on your feet. That's basically what a federally declared disaster is. Now, there's two kinds of disaster assistance that the federal government can give us. It can give us individual assistance, which is down here, which is the kind you always think of when you see the folks out in, in Katrina, down in New Orleans, you know, they're, they're all flooded out. They have no house. They have no clothes. They lost anything. That's individual assistance, right? That's helping people get back on their feet. But really, the most important one, and the one that we really talk about the most and deal with the most, is public assistance. And when I say public assistance, I don't mean welfare, OK? What I mean by public assistance is governments and governmental agencies get money from the federal government to help rebuild the mess that the disaster ca caused, OK? Oops. OK. And when I talk about the mess that the disaster caused, you know that when we get a hurricane, or a snowstorm, or a flood, roads get put out, schools get destroyed, public buildings get, get wrecked. Uh, uh, there's all sorts of expenditures that the taxpayers would have, to, would have to pay for otherwise. So what happens is the local government goes to the state government. And the state government goes out and they say, well, we think there's such and such amount of damage here in uh, Suffolk County. And then 
the, the uh, governor of the state, only the governor of the state can ask for the disaster declaration, all right? So the governor asks the president and says, look, people of Suffolk County have been devastated by this hurricane. I don't want to say that, all right? We need help. Would you, would you please declare a federal disaster? If he thinks it's necessary, he declares it. Federal money starts coming in to help out the taxpayers of Suffolk County to rebuild the roads and the hospitals and the schools and all that stuff that was, uh, that was destroyed. And here you go, since 1954, 84 presidential disasters were declared in New York State. Again, we don't usually think of you know, New York as being a place where a lot of disasters happen. But we, were, we actually got 84 disaster declarations just in New York State. You can see how they're broken up between hurricanes and tropical storms and tornadoes, um, power outages, ice storms, forest fires right here in Suffolk County. Disaster losses in New York State, okay, have cost over $5.3 billion. That's only since 1995. And that's in federal and state disaster payments. So since 1995, we, with the help of these of your local partners here, you have received $5.3 billion in federal disaster aid just here in New York State. Okay, individual preparedness. This is the stuff we want you folks to talk about. I talked about what we do it enough, and our partners here are going to be talking about this as we go on. You want to develop an emergency plan in your home or workplace. You have to have a plan, right? You got to know what you're going to do. Like the senator said, the earthquake came last night, right? Yesterday afternoon. I was sitting in my office, right? I was sitting in an office full of emergency managed professionals. Guess what we did? We ran away. We ran out of the building. <laughs> like everybody else. When we got to, you know, when we got downstairs, somebody says, you know, I think we're supposed to stay in the building and go under the desk. <laughs> Okay? Anyway, I have, a, I have a booklet back there, a white booklet that New York State puts out, what to do in a disaster. And when you look at it, it says, in it, if you look on the earthquake part, first thing it says, don't leave the building. Well, even we did that yesterday. Secure emergency supplies. Our friend from the Red Cross is going to talk to you about that later. Be informed, stay informed, listen to radio, TV, read the paper. I'm sure everybody here does, and you do that before an emergency occurs. So you want to go out. If you haven't done it yet, you want to go out tomorrow, all right, and you want to get those emergency supplies that our friends from the Red Cross are going to be talking about, okay? That's who we are. We're New York State OEM. That is our website. There's a lot of great information on that website, so take that down. What I'm going to be going over is a go bag, talking about sheltering, whether you're going to shelter in home or at a home, and what you need to do to prepare for both. But first, let me talk about the Red Cross for a couple of minutes. Mission statement. The American Red Cross shelters, feeds, and provides emotional support to victims of disasters. It also supplies nearly half of the nation's blood. It teaches life-saving skills. One of the other functions I do for the Red Cross is teach CPR and first aid. Uh, provides international humanitarian aid. Also supports military members and their families. American Red Cross is a charitable organization. It is not a government agency. It depends on volunteers and the generosity of the American people. It's the only way we can keep going is by no donations of the American public. It was started by an act of Congress in 1905, and it basically stated that we will respond to every disaster that comes up in the United States and internationally if asked. Again, the government does not fund us. We do everything through donations of the American public. Our website uh, is www.redcross.org. What we do, we offer shelter, food, and mental health services on an immediate basis. Could be short or long term when we open up a shelter. Could run anywhere from three days. I've been out on deployment where we've been out there for months. So it really depends on the disaster. We respond to about 75 to 80,000 disasters per year nationally. Locally, about 60 to 80 disasters. Predominantly, most of those are fires. And we open shelters when, re when required. I am on call right now. I cannot say for a fact that we are going to open, but I'm on call right now for this weekend, just an event. Uh, if we, in fact, do open up shelters, you can go on to Suffolk County, which I'm sure they'll talk about momentarily. 
SuffolkCountyNY.com or .org, I'm not sure it is. GOV. GOV. And it will list the shelters and probably list the shelters that are actually opening. All right, let's talk about sheltering. If you're going to stay home, things that you need. Water. Can somebody tell me how much water you would need? Gallon per person, Gallon per, person per day is the standard. What about flushing toilets? What are you going to use? You're going to use water, but you're going to use your drinking water? No. no. So what are you going to do? Fill up your tub. You're going to fill your tub, keep an empty bucket in the house, and that's what you're going to use to drain your toilets. Meds and current scripts. In the event you run out of medication, instead of trying to track down your doctor, have a current script available so you can go to the pharmacy and get it refilled. Uh, eyeglass cleaner. Uh, also, if you have contact lenses, have your contacts ready with your cleaner. Food. What type of food should you have? Canned food, non-perishable. And for those of us that are getting up there, what type of food should you have? Manual can opener or a pop lid? Pop lid. There's a lot of food now that's now coming out there with a pop lid on it, so you don't have to use a manual can opener. Okay. First aid kit. Photocopy of important documents. Here's my documents right here. Photocopy in a plastic bag. I've also got them on a thumb drive. I've got one son with his wife in Santa Monica. The other one's up in Seattle. Both of them have been given a thumb drive with my important documents. I spend about 30% of the year in Florida. 19, uh, excuse me, 2004, two hurricanes. Irene and uh, Jean and Francis, I think it was. Got hit direct hits. Lost my condo. Everything was gone. Had to rebuild. Documents, everything. Learned a valuable lesson. Photocopy all of your important documents. Whatever you consider you, you would have problems trying to get back, photocopy, marriage license, birth certificate, social security card, credit card, it doesn't matter. Photocopy everything, put them in a plastic bag. Cash. ATMs will be down. You need cash. Whatever amount you feel comfortable with, that's up to you, but you need cash in case you need to go to the store to buy something. Gas. Make sure your cars are filled with gas. If you have a propane tank for, for a gas barbecue, make sure that's filled. Flashlight with batteries or a crank. I happen to like this one. This is mine. My wife found this in Ace Hardware. Goes back to the old days of the crank. No batteries. Okay? For every minute you crank this, you have a minute of light. But what I really it's got a radio, it's got a siren. But what I really like about this particular one. You can take the charger from your car, put it in the back, and put the other end in your cell phone. Crank it. It'll charge your cell phone. So for every minute you crank this, you'll have a minute of talk time on your cell phone. A radio with batteries, again, or with a crank, hand sanitizer in case we don't have any water. We need to wash your hands. Bathroom supplies, matches, food supplies for an infant. One of the things that we had at the shelter when we ran out in Wedding River. People came in with their infants, no formula, no diapers. We had to find a drug store or a store had some people running out trying to find diapers and formula for these babies. This would be a problem. All right, so this is if you're going to shelter in home. Let's assume you're going to go to a shelter. What do you need at a shelter? You need clothes. You need a change of clothing. Understand a shelter is a place where you can be comfortable, warm. We will feed you. It's a safe place. But think of it a, a step above a dormitory. OK? We give you a cot, we give you a blanket, we give you food. But you need to bring mostly everything else. Again, meds and current scripts, glasses and or contacts with a contact cleaner, antiseptic wipes. We will have bathrooms operating and the showers are working. I do Sachem East and Comstock High School, and I know both of those have showers, and everything else is working there. Bedding. If you've ever slept on a cot more than a day or two, it's a problem. When I go out on deployment, it's anywhere from two to three weeks. I've actually got an air mattress that I put on my cot when I go out, because it gets to be a little tough to sleep on a cot for a while, after a while. Sleeping bag, pillow, linens, Sleepwear, earplugs. 
does get noisy, okay? Toiletries and towels, toys for your kids, cell phone and charger, we will have basic electricity at the shelter. So you can charge your phone, all right? Bring your charger. Photocopy of important documents again, cash, comfort items, things that you would need, flashlight and batteries. And why I say a flashlight, even though we have lights, at night when we go into the dormitory, right, where you people will be sleeping, it gets dark. If you're at the far end of the gym, which is probably where you're going to be, and you've got to come outside the gym to go to the facilities, you've got to walk down this long uh, row, because we have people separated by rows, so you've got to walk down this long row. You don't want to bump into somebody that's already sleeping. So you need to bring a small flashlight so you don't bump into anybody. Again, formula and supplies for children, <clears throat> we will help you after the fact. When we first start up a shelter, we have 100, 150 people. We may, may not be able to help you right away. So you need to have that when you first come in. Let me see what else I've got there. This is stuff that you can buy, power bars. These are blocks of food. The expiration date on these go on for years. They won't, they won't go bad. Uh, Walmart, you can probably buy all this. My wife buys these at the vitamin shop. These are power bars. This is what she uses. All right. Crank flashlight, CVS wipes, comfort kit, got a razor, hair shampoo, various soaps, things like that you would need at a shelter. Flashlight, glasses. Believe it or not, folks, this is what we carry. I have this ready to go. As I said, I'm on call right now. If I get the call to go, I, I got the call at, I believe it was 3 o'clock in the morning to go to William Floyd Park. Uh, William Floyd High School. Well, I was sleeping, I packed up my bag, and I went. I didn't have time to go packing up all this stuff. Red Cross runs 25 shelters. They're all over Long Island. You go on the Suffolk County website, and it'll show you where all the shelters are in Suffolk County. And then you figure out which one is the closest to you. The reality is, though, that may not be the one that opens. Depending on where the disaster is going to hit, we will open them up strategically. If the, sh if the storm's coming onto the South Shore, obviously we're not going to open up shelters on the South Shore. They'll be opened up on the North Shore. So you need to see where the storm's going to hit and figure out which shelter you're going to go to. That's why I suggest you go on there to see which ones are around after we make the announcement and figure out which one you're going to go to and how to get there. Also, one other thing, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. If you have a pet, uh, you cannot bring a pet unless it's a service animal to the Red Cross. We are not allowed to take any pets into a uh, shelter unless it's a service animal. There are, pet, uh, there are pet friendly shelters on Long Island, which John will talk about when he talks about Suffolk County OEM, but we do not allow pets into a shelter. By Suffolk County rules, we cannot take them. What I brought with me tonight in the back on my table is a couple of things. I brought some brochures. The key one that I really want you to take home is in case of emergency. I will not run out of these. I have enough for everyone in here. And it gives you incredible tips. Most importantly, it gives you phone numbers to contact. When you open the brochure, on the inside of the brochure right away are links in here to the Red Cross, to the State Emergency Management Office, to uh, the Center for Disease Control, Homeland Security, National Weather Service, Red Cross and so on. This is very, very important to take home with you. It's also on the LIPA website. We'll go through that. All right, so I have my brochures with me tonight. We're going to talk about severe storms. Obviously, we're, we're concerned about hurricanes, but that situation, that go kit that you have here can be for any kind of emergency. It could be if we have a thunderstorm and a tree falls on your house, because you guys have a lot of nice trees around here, and you have to leave your house, go to a hotel, or you have to go to a shelter because your house has been impacted by a tree. Severe storm preparations, hurricanes and weather and other weather incidents. When was the last hurricane to hit Long Island? Come on, this is interactive. I hear Gloria. Gloria was actually the last hurricane to hit Long Island. Hurricane Bob in the early 90s didn't really hit Long Island. The center of the storm was off of Montauk. 
It did have some influence on Long Island. About 400,000 customers were impacted out east, okay? But the hurricane didn't hit Long Island. So even if it doesn't hit Long Island, if this storm is further east, it's going to catch one side of the storm. This is a very dangerous storm. Uh, they're saying it could be a Category 4, and of course it'll downgrade as it gets further up north. So these things, regardless of whether they come right over us or they're to the east of us, they will impact Long Island. Severe storms, we want you to plan now, all right? This is just-in-time training. This is like training the troops right before the war. Just-in-time training, okay? As you can see up here, this is a made-up chart, a made-up uh, slide here. It says Hurricane Bart, August 7th. I run a drill program for the for Long Island Power Authority, and that was my scenario. I wonder if you take a look at today's uh, satellite picture, that might be very close, okay? So we get folks ready, all right? For those kind of events, for hurricanes, we also have tornadoes on Long Island. Who would have thought we have tornadoes on Long Island? Last weekend, the National Weather Service put out a weather report that there were supposed to be some bad thunderstorms on Sunday with embedded tornadoes. Didn't happen, thank goodness, but we have to plan for those. Last year, 2010, severe storms up in Great Neck. They had a downburst, 100 mile an hour winds. I have never seen damage like that up in that area. Haven't seen damage on Long Island. I've been a Hurricane Gloria, Hurricane Bob. That was unbelievable, the damage that took place up there. And last March 13th, um, 2010, we had a wind and rainstorm. We had 275,000 customers out as a result of that incident. That was an un it was supposed to be 40, 50 mile an hour winds. Well, it turned out to be 70 mile an hour winds, and it just inundated the island. They were all over Long Island. Most of it was in Nassau County, but the outages were spread throughout Long Island. Planning for that. And most recently, we had a heat wave. July 21st through the 24th, we had heat waves. We had 58,000 customers affected because of that heat wave. All right. Most of the outages occur because the system's overloaded, the transformer on the, on the pole uh, is overloaded, has to be reset, or the fuse blows. But as you can see, that's also distributed throughout Long Island. Long Island service ter territory is pretty diverse. Long Island's not that big. We have 1,200 square miles, and we have about 1.1 million customers, and it's very different. We are the second utility in New York City, I don't know if you knew that, the Long Island Power Authority services the Rockaways. So there's Con Ed, and there's Little Lipa in the corner there, Little Lipa, all right? And as you can see, as you go further east, eastern Suffolk, large geographic area, and has the Twin Forks, all right? So there's challenges in, in all of those areas. Okay, how do we get the system ready for hurricane season? Well, in the state of New York, we're an overhead utility, and we're very good at restoring electricity for an overhead utility. We consistently score high in, in the scorecard, so to speak, or the, or the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, evaluation tools that they use to take a look at utilities on how we restore electricity. So we're very good at restoring power. Line clearance. Trees are very nice, but lines and tree limbs don't work together. We tree trim around 2,000 miles of wire a year. So we drive down and we trim those trees every, every year. We do about 2,000 miles. We also make sure that we do some equipment improvements continuously. We have radio control switches on the lines. That means out of the substation in your neighborhood, you have an electric substation that supplies electricity to the neighborhood. And on those circuits that go through the neighborhood, there's a switch in the middle. And years ago, if there was a tree that fell down on that circuit, everyone on that circuit would be out of, out of power. But because we've aggressively installed radio-controlled switches, we're able to isolate the damage from a control room in a control center, and then we can keep half of the customers on that circuit on. We can also reroute power from a control center so we don't have to send people out in a field to operate switches. So we have somewhat of a smart grid. We put up good wire, replace old wire. We continually do that. 
And the other neat thing that we do every year is we fly helicopters over the system with an infrared camera. We look at 6,000 miles of our system every year, and we look for weak spots in the system. And once we do that, yes? OK. They're leaving left and right on us. And when we see those hot spots on the system, we fix them because they're weak spots. So during storms, they would cause outages. So this is how we get the system ready every year for the, for the storm season. People, that's where I come in and the group that I work with, we're with emergency restoration, emergency planning, and we plan and train people. That's the keys to an effective storm response. Right now, you're training. You're being trained right now. When you go home, you're going to plan, right? So tonight, we're going through planning and training. Our program is designed to prepare the organization for the coming storm season. We have people that go out in the field and do their storm jobs on sunny days, and that's a three-month program. And we also have LIPA and National Grid officials actually do their command and control functions. The head of National Grid, the head of LIPA, they go through a drill. All right, we also assess the facilities and the readiness of our system. Now that LIPA is prepared, what can you do? Because you also play a big role in that. We need you to prepare. Knowledge is definitely power. These, these brochures here have a tremendous amount of information in them, and I need you to take them with you. It may be a little bit rough right now to get somebody to cut some bad limbs down that are leaning over on your house, but think about your property. Think about the tree stock on your property. Is it healthy trees? So you need to take a look at your trees. Are they aged or diseased? Because when we get that wind, anything that's weak is going to come down, and you'd rather trim it now than trim it when it's on your roof or going through your, through your roof. So take a look at that. Flooding. We've had a tremendous amount of flooding on Long Island with all these I haven't seen rain like this in a long time. I live in a private community that out east that has lakes. We have three uh, little lakes, and they're at the top from the amount of rainwater we've had. It's absolutely amazing. Flooding, though, can prevent you from going to different locations. So you may have to map out different ways of getting to a place. So just think how flooding that we've had recently may impact you if you have to evacuate your area or go to some place because of an emergency. The trees are in danger of striking the, the, the building. Taking down wires. If you have a tree on your property that's making contact with a wire, that's not a good thing. I need you to call the Long Island Power Authority and have them trim that, that limb. So if you go home tonight or you see tomorrow, you know that's there. Call us. I don't know if we're going to be able to get to it right now, but le at least call us. Be aware of that and make, make the phone calls. The LIPA website, this is another way that you can prepare yourselves for this storm season and for storms in general. The LIPA website has a location here called Storm Center. You'll notice when you go onto the LIPA website, probably tomorrow morning, there'll be an upfront message here that will talk about the preparations that we're doing, and they're also going to impress upon you to get ready also. Okay, so when I click on that Storm Center, it gives us all this information here. What I want to focus on over here is about outage information, OK? We can also, if there's outages on Long Island, you can click on that and you can view the outage map on Long Island, OK? So uh, I'm sorry, I just want to go back real quick. We're going to go over here and we're going to click on this safety and preparedness, all the brochures that I have and additional information. You click on safety and preparedness, it will give you safety tips for hurricane safety, windstorm safety, lightning, windstorm, heat emergencies. The hurricane safety information that's on the website, I believe it's about 10 pages or seven pages long. A lot of good information. But one of the things it talks about up on top where it says hurricane safety, talks about a disaster supply kit. Doesn't that sound familiar? Red Cross was just talking about that. Consistent message. Preparing an evacuation plan for your family. One of the bullets here talks about tips for those with special medical needs, OK? And that gets down to this brochure. If you have someone in your house that's on a medical device, such as a, uh, a suction machine, a respirator, an IV feeding machine, I want you to take one of these home with you, OK? This is for a life support apparatus customer. 
take this home anyway with you because we don't know what, what life has to hold for us. So if we do um, get involved with a medical situation, we know the program. In case of emergency, here are phone numbers for emergency preparedness organizations, the state of New York, FEMA, Homeland Security, Department of Energy, and so on. Windstorm safety, all right? Windstorms, thunderstorms happen on Long Island all the time. And it's those kinds of things where we get ourselves into trouble. Let the storm system pass. And then you can go out and go shopping or go what you do what you have to do. But just be aware, there are storm, windstorm safety tips on the, on the, uh, on the uh, LIPA website here. Very, very important. Again, here's the LIPA website. It starts off at www.lipower.org, and then you can link into it. Next thing I want to talk about is the reporting an outage. You can do this, you can report an outage. Now some people say, well, my lights are out in the house, how am I gonna do that if the computer's out? Some people have batteries on their computers, they have air cards, they can communicate. Or if you're at your office, and you know that there's an outage at your house for some reason, you can actually call in a part light or no lights, you can click on. Down power, we don't want you reporting it through the internet. We want you to make a phone call. And that number is 1-800-490 0075, and that's important for the potential storm coming up. Any down power lines, and you treat any wire that's down as a down power line, because you don't know the difference between the phone wire, the cable vision wire, the fiber optic wire for VIOS, or our wires. Everything is treated as our wires, and you call that in. If there's a wire down and it's burning in the street, well, I don't want you calling that number, I want you to call the fire department or I want you to call 911 right away because then they call us. Remember before I talked about the outage map? Well, this is the outage map for Long Island and these little triangles here represent customers that are out of service. You can go over here and click on this area, outage by area, and it will give you the outages all in Nassau County and the Rockaway Peninsula, Suffolk County, and then it breaks it down by town. And then using that little plus sign over there, you can go and look at villages. You can also get your restoration estimate here. All right, so we do put restoration estimates in here. Important points again, downed wires, 800-490-0075. One quick second. Charcoal, please don't use charcoal indoors. Everybody still uses that. The fire department would really not, not enjoy going to your house and find out that you've been cooking indoors, all right? The other thing is we talk about disconnecting appliances, equipment, electronics. When you lose your electricity, unplug things because when that voltage surge comes in, if you don't have a power strip with a really good surge suppressor, you may have some, some difficulties later on. Standby generator. If you're gonna go out and buy a Honda generator today or tomorrow, that's gonna plug your refrigerator in, extension cord to the refrigerator, put that generator outside. Don't have it run inside, because the fumes, they're not good for you, right? The big thing we want you to take away from here tonight is the difference between a notice event and a no notice event. Something we see coming like a hurricane, we see it five days out. You folks that live on the North Shore, you know, all this talk about going to shelters for hurricanes, stuff like that, you're so overwhelmed with that stuff, and, and it really doesn't apply to you. A hurricane shelter, shouldn't be really what you're worried about because there should be no reason that you find yourself in a hurricane shelter. Because you can plan five days out. You know where you're gonna go. And if you're not comfortable riding at that storm in your house, then you make arrangements to go to a friend's house, something like that. Now, if a tree falls through your home and your home's inhabitable or something like that, it's a different story. That's a no-notice event. You can't plan for that. Weather affects not only us, but weather affects infrastructure. It affects response for the fire department, or response for the railroad, or respond, ambulance responses. And when we're in the emergency operations center, we try and help coordinate when we have a snowstorm. You know, we got a call, one of these past snowstorms from Brookhaven Hospital doesn't have a maternity ward. They needed to get a patient from Brookhaven Hospital to Stony Brook Hospital. But there was two feet of snow on the ground. How do we do that? We have to coordinate the plows to get them there. But they have to go across town roads, county roads, and state roads to do it. So in the Emergency Operations Center, we have, in, we have representatives from all those agencies, decision makers, that we could say, we need a plow on the corner of Fifth and Elm, we need a plow here, so on and so forth, to coordinate that and make that work. So we talk about hurricane seasons. Worst on record, Katrina Reed of 2005. 
A lot of lessons learned from that. We'll hit on that really quick. I don't want to keep you guys much longer. 2010 season was very active. Wasn't as active as predicted, but it was very active. Remember Hurricane Earl? We did a lot of preparations. LIPA did a lot of preparations. And still, in the media, for the preparations they did for that storm, getting ready. Doug showed a picture of the East Hampton Airport with all those trucks lined up. That was preparations for a storm that never came. And now everybody wants to crucify him for spending that money to prepare. If they don't, what's the alternative? Instead of being out of power for 14 days, we might be out of power for a month, a month and a half. Nobody wants to be out of power for an hour. So, you know, we, it's, you know it's a give and take. Uh, the 2011 season predictions, if those of you who don't know, we have a lot of name storms already this year. We're up to the letter I. Uh, three to six major hurricanes predicted this year, category three or better. We have our first, Irene. She's category three today. Most active time of the, the hurricane seasons, mid-October, uh, mid-August to mid-October. Uh, some of the things the county works on all the time, evacuation, shelters, special needs populations, big, big lesson learned from Hurricane Katrina. Pet population, big. People will die for their pets. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and a whole, whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, we're always planning for the worst case scenario. Some of the things we do, you don't need to know about this stuff. Just know that we're always, always, always planning with our regional partners. And what I mean by that, Nassau County, New York City, Westchester, we're always at the table together. When we do a plan, we do it together. So we can pull, give and take. We can share resources. Um, we, we benefit all the time. N New York City Emergency Management is huge. They have a lot, a lot of people. And we benefit all the time from their, from their manpower by planning together. Uh, our Emergency Operations Center, Basically, what you need to know about our emergency operations center, and I'll show you a picture in a second. I'll show you a picture now. Emergency operations center, basically, in essence, becomes the alternate seat of government during a disaster. And what happens is, it's a room. Take this room. Imagine each one of you represent a different agency. But you're a decision maker from that agency. It could be a local agency. It could be a state agency. It could be a federal agency. It could be uh, a utility. It could be fire departments. Depending on what that emergency is, it could be the Red Cross, the SPCA. Depending on what that emergency is, dictates who sits in those seats at that time. And they're decision makers from those agencies, and as things come up, emergencies are handled. And, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, uh, a two-bedroom fire in a house. The fire department handles that. We're talking about things that cross town lines, cross county lines, things that overwhelm the local government. And when they overwhelm the local government, they kick up to the county government. And when they overwhelm the county government, they kick up to the state government. And when they overwhelm the state, it kicks up to the federal government. The federal government will never, ever, ever answer a resource if the county executive calls FEMA and says, we need 10 of these. It doesn't work like that. Go through the state. We call the state and say, we need 10 of these. The state says, well, why do why you need 10 of those? They, we, you know, there's 15 more in the town over. Go to them. We have to prove that, well, they're using those. And not that it's a lengthy process, but it's, it's a process. And they don't just fill resource requests for no reason. But when you need it, that's, how, that's the process we use to get it. Uh, the software we've done. Hervac. This is a computer program we use in the EOC. And, and basically, what this does is every one of these dots represents information about the storm. And what we can do with this computer program is we could say, it could tell us how long we need to evacuate Fire Island, uh, how long we have the, er the cone of error. Um, by pressing these buttons, we could see that, you know, 50 miles to the west, 50 miles to the east, something's going, you know, it could potentially hit here or there, whatever the case is. It's an excellent, excellent program. We use it all the time. We used it today. Hurricane inundation zones, they don't really apply to you guys, but if you have family on the South Shore, you could share with them. They can go to our website. They could punch in their address, and it could tell them if they're in a hurricane inundation zone. And there's four, category one, two, three, four, and... Basically, by punching your address in, you can find out, you know, each one of these represents a different, a different uh, inundation zone. But also, you can find out evacuation routes. Now, the gentleman from Red Cross talked about shelters. You could put your address in, you could find the Red Cross shelters in your area. There's actually 144 designated Red Cross shelters. Only plan, it, plan to staff 25, maximum 25. There's 25 locations, they're called the top tiers. They're opened five at once, then 10, then 10, if necessary. Areas would be determined based on the emergency, things like that. 
Uh, I don't know the closest ones to here. You'd have to look. But again, when in a hurricane scenario, you shouldn't have to worry about uh, shelter, you know, up, up here. If you have family that lives on the South Shore or friends, you should open your house to them because no one wants to, become, wants to be in a shelter. You do not want to find yourself in a shelter. It's not a hotel. When we see something coming five days out, there's no reason to be in a shelter. You should make plans. Unless you have no other, you know, no other choice, that's what shelters are for. But you, do, you should do your best or, or help you know, others to, to, to shelter them if you can. County-run shelters, uh, first responder shelter, pet-friendly shelter, special needs shelters, these are all huge lessons learned from Hurricane Katrina. First responders, firemen, police, they're human beings. They have family. They love their family. If they think their family is going to die secondary to a storm, they're going to go with their family first. It's human nature. They shouldn't be faulted for that. So let's just learn from Katrina and Rita. The county has designated first responder shelters. Also, the county's reached out to fire departments to try and get fire departments that need to create shelters to do so. Uh, pet friendly shelters. There's three locations on pet friendly shelters. Suffolk County Fire Academy, Duck Stadium, Suffolk Community College. The capacity of all three shelters combined is 750 pets, 550 people. That's it. So you think that's going to fill up quick? Probably. Now, the idea with these shelters is you go to the shelter, you're supposed to take care of your own animal. So you should bring food for the animal, bring a bowl, water bowl, things like that. Will there be things there? Yes, there'll be things provided. But you should go self-sufficient for your animal. You have to bring the records with the animal, prove that the animal had rabies shots, things like that. So that's stuff that you should gather now. If you plan on going to a shelter, you should have that stuff ready when you need to go. Now, the middle of the night, boom, 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 get out of your house, stuff like that, different scenario. Uh, and again, you would be housed in the location with your pet, just you wouldn't sleep with the animal. Uh, special needs shelters. Three locations, John J. Foley, Suffolk Community Colleges, Town Special Needs Shelters. Again, if you have a family member that has special needs and you think you're going to need sheltering, learn where these places are, you know, look it up now. thing that we're working on the county, uh, resource the county has, Joint Emergency Evacuation Program. If you have someone that medically is incapable of evacuating themselves, you can, you can take an application. They're in the back. Those are the ones that are stapled to the green sheet. Fill it out. Have a doctor sign off on them. They go into a database. And those people are contacted regularly uh, through us when, when incidents happen. And we will evacuate them if necessary. Uh, evacuation, there's no plan to evacuate Long Island. It's not practical. There's no scenario that should arise where the entire island has to be evacuated. So what we say in emergency management is you run from the water, hide from the wind. You folks, you don't have to worry about the water, so you're going to shelter in place unless you're told to do otherwise. And the way you find that stuff out, is through emergency notifications, the media, TV. We'll let them know. We'll send out code, res code red messages, just like we did yesterday about the, the earthquake, things like that. The thing with this stuff is you have to want the information. We heard tonight several times, knowledge is power. You have to want to know. And that, when you seek the information, it's there. You'll find it. My name is Nick Kafalis. I am a senior fire marshal with the town of Smithtown. Uh, I know you've been here a while. I'm going to be two minutes. I'm no PowerPoint or anything. Just wanted to uh, introduce myself and make myself available for any questions. Uh, when it comes to the town of Smithtown, um, in the event of any county declared emergency, um, my office will work with the county. Uh, they would open the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center. We would send a representative out to that EOC. And we have a direct link from the town to the county. So if there's any resources that need to be acquired, uh, we can do that during the, uh, the activation of the EOC. Uh, we also work very closely with the fire departments, all the local fire departments here. If they need any resources when it comes to uh, preparedness and, and recovery, uh, we can get those resources from the town to assist the fire department in any way. Um, as you know, the fire department is going to be your first, uh, first response agency for anything local, and we coordinate with, with those fire departments for the town. Um, the number for my office, if anybody wants to take it down, for any local emergencies, anything in the town of Smithtown, we do have an emergency operations center that we will open up in the town of Smithtown for anything locally 
uh, emergency-wise. The phone number is 631-360-7553. That's a 24-hour dispatch, and it is an overflow line, so if that line is ever busy, it goes to another line. So any, uh, any need to, to report anything in the town of Smithtown, call that number. That's the Department of Public Safety, and uh, we'll be happy to assist. Um, any questions regarding the town? Yes, sir. Were there any shelters in the town? I'm not saying are any available right now, but where, where were shelters available? Unfortunately, I... No, there's no specific Red Cross or county shelters in the town. Uh, I believe the closest is going to be Comac. Uh, I'm not sure, John, if you're... I don't know specifically which ones they offer. Sometimes okay. they change depending on the use, things like that. Again, uh, if in the, in the event of an emergency, not all the shelters will be open. We will have to contact the county and find out which ones will be open, if any, and uh, we will disseminate that information. Um, also on that note, um, the town of Smithtown does have two public access television channels. Uh, if you have cable vision, it's channel 18, and if you have Verizon Fios, it's channel 27. And we do disseminate specific town-wide information on those channels. If you uh, do have your power and you're watching television, you may get some information from those uh, television stations. 